Well, good day, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to share with you how innovations can happen in, I call it, the business ecosystem. And these are value chain innovations. As you know, uh, innovations can happen in multiple ways, so within business, within governments, within the public sector. And we oftentimes would think of innovations as product innovations or service innovations. Products, of course, we all know is a new product, a new feature, a new functionalities. And that, of course, has tremendous values. But what sometimes we have overlooked are the opportunities where these are non-product innovations, the innovations about how you work with your partners, how you deal with your customer bases, and how you interact with the public at large. And there are new ways to do that. And in fact, many of these ways can lead to values. So what do we mean by a value chain and an, an ecosystem? So let me show you an example. Suppose we are dealing with a mobile phone company, a mobile phone company that makes cell phones. Of course, most natural, we would think of the mobile phone companies as a manufacturing company because there are suppliers to the components, to the various pieces, uh, sub-assemblies that eventually you have to put them together and distribute it through channels, through channels of retailers, through channels of carriers, and eventually getting to the consumers. So that's the traditional way of looking at the value chain. But we also recognize very quickly that this is not sufficient because if you want to be a successful mobile phone company, you have to look at the so-called extended value chain. The extended value chain would involve uh, content. As we know, uh, mobile phone today is not just a device uh, for communication, uh, but lots of interactions related to apps, related to games, related to messaging, and so on. The contents, infrastructure and how can we deliver the content uh, in a seamless way, uh, requiring the big uh, tele telecom systems uh, involving carriers uh, who would be the one that distribute the product and contents and even payment systems as well, and other many, many merchants. But again, that's not sufficient. If you think about the much bigger picture, a mobile phone works under a much, much bigger, I call it the ecosystem. The ecosystems would involve like financial institutions, governments, the governments, the legal systems, who allow you to operate in a certain way, especially when you're talking about cross borders. Um, and these days, uh, logistics providers uh, that perhaps would also help you to deliver products and processes which resulted from the transactions uh, that happened in your phones, the new technologies uh, that are being developed, and ultimately many, many in many, many settings, uh, even the nonprofit uh, or non-government organizations, the activists may also have a role, depending on whether your operations, your new concept, your new towers uh, station may impact uh, constituents. And they may be organized to either support you or, in some cases, uh, hurt you. So in a way, we have to manage the whole ecosystem to be successful. And when I talk about innovations in the ecosystems, what I meant is how do we interact with all these constituents in an innovative way, a new way, a new way that would enable you to be more successful. And it's sometimes not just you yourself being successful, but it could also be how the rest of the ecosystem also benefit from it. So it's not like this is a zero-sum game that if I win, some part of the ecosystems may hurt. This is not always the case, and so we have to recognize that if it's a case where some wins and some loses, then we have to account for it, and we have to find a way to reduce the losses, and perhaps even got those losses into wins. So that's the reason why we have to look at it from the ecosystem perspective. Because otherwise, if you have a successful product, but by yourself, you may not be able to get to realistic benefits and success in the marketplace, because some parts of the ecosystems could not see the benefits and they may actually act in opposite ways that may reduce the chance of your success. So what can we do for innovations that are beyond products and services in the ecosystems? So here today, I want to share with you six ways in which those innovations can occur. These are by no means uh, exhaustive, but I wanted to highlight them because they are most uh, perhaps significant. And these are all based on examples and based on the work that I've done and observed over the years. So I want to share with you. And some of them may now become very standard 
practices that companies must do if you want to be successful, you want to make sure you have the right relationship with your partners. But in what way can we improve those relationships? So I hope that this sharing would enable us to perhaps get some nuggets uh, that you'll be able to s get stimulated into new thoughts on how you would deal with your ecosystem partners. These six elements are as follows. First is that there are always innovation, which is sometimes like this is bread and butter, for us to look at your own self, the innovations that happen inside your own self. And, and that because you yourself is a part of the ecosystem. So don't forget that we can also start with your own self, ways to do things differently, processes that would result in improvements or in result in efficiency gains and cycle time gains, etc. So that I call within node innovations. Second one would be linkages, because as I mentioned, we are one part of the ecosystem. So there are many, many players, some direct, some indirect. And those involve links. Links could be in the form of communication, information sharing, or it could be in the form of transportation, logistics. Uh, and so all of those are linkages. And how can we work on the linkages? So this time is not just you yourself but we have to work with the partners so that the linkages can be strengthened, so that the linkages can be done in a different way. The third one is we are becoming more global. We are a global enterprise. Most of us are becoming, yeah, even if we may start as a company that is more regional based, but very quickly if you want to build to scale, you have to deal with a global, global ecosystem. And it could be that not your immediate suppliers but your supplier suppliers, and somewhere you may be getting those minerals from somewhere in Africa, and therefore you are part of the global global ecosystem. When we are in an ecosystem that involves the global enterprise, we have borders. Borders and also different nooks that you have to deal with. And I think the integration, how you integrate, how you work with them, and how you are able to maybe using information or using planning, uh, using collaboration, are ways that you can develop new way of working with others. And so that's the cross notes integration that I'm referring to. Workflow innovation would simply be you, even if you want to deliver the same products and the same service, the methods and the ways, the sequence, um, of the workflow that would that be involved can be changed. And that way, the workflow innovation may result in you doing one step before the other or doing things in parallel, or in some cases, eliminating some of the steps totally. The next one is I call reconfiguration. Reconfiguration is also kind of like a very significant byproduct of the globalization. When we talk about globalization, they are all over the world, and there would, of course, be borders that we have to cross, and there are also lead times that we have to deal with. Um, countries that are far away sometimes may require more time to get to. Of course, this is not un uh, universal, because sometimes a country that is close enough, but because you do not have the right processes in place, or because the government custom clearance processes are so difficult, that actually it may take you more time and effort to get the products in and out. So it's to recognize all of these, both the strengths of the countries, the excellence in terms of the expertise of the country's internal capabilities, uh, and the cost economies, transportation costs, and the trade agreements, and also the government incentives that would require us to reconfigure your network. And when you reconfigure the network, that's an innovation in an innovative way, coming up with a new way that really would result in much higher efficiency and uh, responsiveness. The final one is perhaps the biggest of all, and oftentimes is the most difficult, is the relationship size. So that even if you're working still with the same company, I'm still using the same configuration and I am still doing the same kind of information exchange and the same workflow but the relationship that we have with the partners. And by the relationship, it could be the contractual relationship. It could be who does what, how do we perform, each, uh, performance measurements uh, managed across companies, and the roles and responsibilities, the incentives that we put in place, all of those were business relationships. 
And I think that is something that we can also focus on. So let me go through these one by one. Innovation within a node. So this time we're supposed to be zero in one node, uh, which I think I used the diagram here and then I zero in the yellow portion, which is one node. Inside a node, I think innovation can occur. Let me give you an example of this e-commerce company, a fast-growing e-commerce company in China called Yaoden. Yaoden is an e-commerce company just like Amazon uh, that we are familiar with in the most part of the world. And they are a fast-growing company. This company is amazing. It's the growth is exponential. And Walmart has invested significantly into this company, and so they are part of the Walmart empire now. But this company, the thrive of this company resulted in the company having now an explosive customer base, and the orders are exponentially growing every day. But what they found is that the ability to pick and pack inside a warehouse becomes a bottleneck. Uh, customers order all kinds of things, all kinds of baskets, and the warehouses are becoming bigger and bigger, and the stock keeping units are huge. How can you pick and pack and send the product out on the same day or even within the same hour and be able to deliver to the customers on time becomes a major, major differentiation. So what this company focuses on is using information. And they have a host of information technologies invested heavily in order processing and customer service uh, softwares, product management software, warehouse management systems, transportation management systems, and CRM, etc. And here is what the companies discover is that as a result of that kind of innovation, this is so-called inside the note innovation, inside even a warehouse in this case, inside a warehouse, how can we manage this well? Amazingly is that on average, what they found is that a customer on average would order 16 items to them, grocery items, books, and so on. And a typical, typical warehouse that this company has has 70,000 stock keeping units. And it's huge, 25,000 square meters. So if you have to look for these 16 items and put them together, pack them together into one basket and then package them, label them, and then ship them out, how long do you think it would take? Dr. Gang Yu, who is the chairman of the company, who was actually former, formerly the vice president at the Amazon, and he posed me this question, and he says that as a result of the tremendous integrated information systems, the intelligent, smart way of putting the right item in the right place in the warehouse is only 127 seconds. On average, this is amazing, of course, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, depending on the basket. But the average that he was able to achieve is 127 seconds. That's about two minutes two minutes to be able to retrieve. Of course, there are lots of automation involved in the warehouse, but still, this is admirable. That's the kind of within-node innovation that will result in tremendously agile value change. Agility is sometimes the differentiation, sometimes it's also the way that you compete well, and e-commerce in China is thriving, and it's very important. Speed is everything, especially in an emerging economy like China. Customer service is everything. Customer experience is everything. So we're seeing these very interesting, exciting things. And that's just one example. And I think there are many, many other examples, but I just want to highlight this to show that there are things to be done inside a node. But what about linking nodes, linking two nodes? Like we have two nodes here, but we're focusing on not the inside of each of the nodes, but the linkage between two nodes. Well, as I mentioned earlier, is that because this globalization, globalization resulted in sometimes the two nodes being in two different countries. In a study by the World Bank, which I collaborated in a few years ago, what I found is that oftentimes it's not the distance between two countries that resulted in difficulties in linkages, but it's crossing the border. How easy, how fast can you cross the border? How many signatures do you require from the custom office to sign off before you can ship? How many inspections are required? How many documents do you need? And all of those were steps. So in a recent study that Professor Warren Hausman uh, at the Management Science and Engineering Department of Stanford, uh, we collaborated together on studying a very simple, simple problem. This problem is China to US trade. The trade process involved if you want to ship products from China to the US. It turns out there are over 120 steps involved just to get products in and out of the country. We're not talking about even manufacturing and transportation. We're talking about just all the steps that you need in order for the governments to allow you to ship products out in and out. And 
linkage innovation in this case would be what can we do so that those linkages can be much better. And what we found is that there are two ways, two ways to do that. One, of course, is to make every step faster. And that's more internal, like internal within node processes. Within node processes is that you can do something digitized, or you can have the documents prepared ahead of time, and then you'll be more efficient, and you'll be more accurate, and they're more reliable so that you don't have errors. But the other one is to see if there are steps that you can completely change, eliminate, because of the fact that you have assurance, because you have the government's approval be ahead, you are a trusted party, and you provide the information ahead of time to the US Customs Office. And you are able to perhaps skip some steps, parallel processing some steps, elimination of some steps. And those are the linkage innovation that resulted in much faster short cycle time, much more reliable processes, less capital tied up, and of course you get paid faster if you can ship things faster. Huge benefits. We call this the IT-enabled linkage improvements. The IT-enabled linkage improvements benefits the manufacturer who is shipping things out, benefits the retailers or the shippers who is in importing, and it also benefits those intermediaries, like banks, who also have capital tied up. If the processes are slow, they also would get money back in a, in a much less timely fashion. Exporters benefit, importers benefit, and that's an example of how linkage design can be done faster. Linkages are about transportation. Linkages are about logistics. Here, because I also have been working in the developing economies as well, uh, as Luis uh, has uh, described my bio, I also increasingly are looking at how we can use value chain innovations in developing economies. And here is an example in Zambia. In Zambia, the linkages are very challenging because people are not maintaining their vehicles well. And so we have a lot of these health ambulances and the motorcycles that were very new, actually two years old, three years old, and they are abandoned. They're abandoned because they don't have the lack, they lack spare parts or because they did not maintain them well. So it's amazing, it's sad to see so many abandoned, abandoned vehicles. As a result, many of the people who live in rural areas have to walk to a health clinic because there are no vehicles. The nurse and the doctors could not visit them because they don't have the right vehicles and motorcycles and so on. So this group, Riders for Health, which I've been working with, is an NGO, and they focus on motorcycles and how they can do the right preventive maintenance that would extend the life of the vehicles and also have a complete solution so that they will be able to provide the oil filters and all these spare parts to get the motorcycles up all the time. And today, the difference is staggering. Here is a picture of the nurse on Riders for Health, riding on the Riders for Health vehicle, and he is now able to visit remote villages and take care of sick children, take care of the many, many, many needs in the health region. And that allow healthcare to be improved. And that's a simple example of how focusing on linkages, focusing on the link of transportation link can make a difference. The next innovation that I want to share with you would be now this time, I have two notes, but I'm not just focusing on the link of transportation link, logistics link, or cross-border. I'm looking at the information management within these two notes, the planning processes within these notes, and what I can do, and I call that integrating the notes, integrating them so that there are two notes but they hopefully by working together and coordinating them together, they would act like just one node. And so we don't have the organization barrier. One simple way is visibility. One simple way innovation is information. That oftentimes the two nodes could not work as well as one single node is because they don't have the full information. I don't know what's going on at your site. So you have sales, you have demand forecasts, you have new products in the roadmap and you know when you want to recycle the products or generate a new product and the next product will come out so that the existing product will become obsolete. And I need to put in place the plan to recycle, the plan to retrieve the old products. Or I have changed my production plan. But if I am a supplier, I'm upstream, I did not know that ahead of time, I did not have the full information ahead of time, I would have distorted information, distorted view. I call that the bull whip effect. The bull whip is distorted view of what is the demand information downstream. My response time would not be fast. I cannot prepare my capacity and resulted in high inventory and the planning cycle becomes slow. So simple, simple things like that, just the right sharing of information is an innovation. This is a simple kind of a basic innovation of having the right information shared. Same way that information from upstream from the supplier can also be shared with the customer on what is a working process. When will the products be arriving? The, 
some of the uh, estimated arrival time, and if there are any delay, alert you ahead of time. One confirm the quantity that I'm shipping to you and any of the updates in capacity plans and inventory plans. That allow the customers to react better if there are problems. That allow the customers to be able to proactively plan and optimize my going forward what I should be doing. And that also enable me to then in turn share the information with my own own customers. I think this is really again another way of having linkages more than just a linkage, but integrating the two nodes. Amazingly, that even though you may think that, wow, this is so simple and straightforward, companies should be sharing all this information, I found, in fact, we still have a long way to go. This kind of innovation, that's why I'm still listing them as an innovation, because for some companies, they haven't been doing that. Here is a survey that I did in 2012 with the SEM World. And the survey was done with the chief supply chain officers of the world. Now, these are people who may have a title of chief supply chain officers or the vice president of supply chain management or directors of supply chain logistics operations. And these are similar titles. So these are people who run supply chain operations in multinational companies. And the survey was conducted and with a large number of replies, 1,340 replies. And one of the questions that we ask is, do you have visibility and that you are able to monitor the social and environmental responsibility performances of your supply chain? Social and environmental responsibility could be like carbon emissions. Do they have violations? Do they have labor violations? Do they have social violations? And so all those are responsibility performances. And it's interesting that, let me uh, explain the, the pie chart here. You can see that blue is the ideal. The blue would be for the executives that says that I actually am able, I am able to see and monitor my whole key supply network, my suppliers, my key suppliers, my supplier suppliers, and I'm able to see whether there are violations or whether how well they're doing in social and environmental responsibility. But the, to, the extreme case is that about 10% of them says that I have nothing. I know nothing. 40%, 44% and the left-hand side is environmental measures and the right-hand side is social responsibility. And you can see about 45, 44% says that I only know about my own self. That is, if it's my factory, my warehouse, yes, I do know. What it means is that there is a big gap. The big gap is that a lot of companies either do not have visibility of their immediate suppliers, and those who do may only have their immediate suppliers, and only about 20% have full visibility. So without visibility, how can you improve? That's why I think I, I like this as an example of a website in China called IPE. IPE is a website that collects information on all kinds of environmental violations in China, throughout whole China. And you can click on the website and you can discover if you have a supplier suppliers in the far remote region or some town, you'll be able to see whether there have been violations and whether they have fixed the problems. That's the kind of visibility that we need. We need to have extended visibility because otherwise it's very dangerous, very difficult for you to manage things well as well as you're vulnerable. So I do believe in this kind of integration. Another kind of integration is knowledge integration. Knowledge integration is an example that I'm here illustrating here where Walmart collaborated with Waller Lambert in terms of knowledge. It's an example of an exceptional heat wave. This is like a while ago uh, in Florida where the heat wave resulted in the growth or of the population of mosquitoes, uh, which resulted in a lot of people get bitten by the mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes resulted in a huge surge in demand for the drugs, for the, for the medicines, uh, for the ointment that Warner Lambert made to treat the mosquito bites. Now, Walmart was not able to figure out that there could be such a surge in demand by themselves, because Walmart was not a product company. They don't have the deep product knowledge, so they are a retailer. While well, Warner Lambert, being a product company, knew the linkages. That heat wave is linked to mosquito, mosquitoes is linked to bikes, and bikes is linked to the demand for their ointments. And so the two companies started collaboration, saying there is a need for not just information exchange, but knowledge exchange. Knowledge exchange resulted in this collaboration so that I'll be enlightened, I'll be ahead of time, know that because the heat wave is something you can forecast. 
you can get it from the observatory that that's the heat wave coming. And I am able to, because of the collaboration with Werner Lambert, be able to stock up all the ointments on my source to avoid the stockouts. So knowledge exchange is another kind of innovation. Workflow innovation this time is about how you do work. It's not about information, it's not about knowledge, but it's only physically how you do things. Here's an example from Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard used to make the desk jet printer, it's the inkjet printer in their factories. They used to a long time ago when they were still manufacturing before they outsourced. So what it means is that they would build those printers in the factories and customize them for different markets. And then they would ship the products to distribution centers and the distribution center could be in Europe, could be in Singapore, could be in North America or South America. Now, once the product has been customized, it has a language in it. It has the power cord, it has the um, language in, in the manuals, and sometimes even the software loaded would have a language requirements. So the products become languageized, languageized to German, Spanish, French. And the problem is that by doing so, once the product hits the distribution center, it's already localized. Localized meaning that you cannot sell a German language printer in France, very hard. Yeah. So that kind of inflexibility hurts HP. So what HP did is that they change the workflow. Now here's the workflow, very intelligent. The workflow is that they still build the product at the factory, the core product in the factory, but the customization of the product into different languages happen in distribution because distribution is closer to the market. As you see more French customers coming, you just customize more French printers in the DC or the customers in Spain has declined in sales, and then you customize less. So the customization resulted in what is called postponement. Beautiful, and that's the workflow change. But they don't stop there. Interestingly is that as HP start offshoring, meaning they outsource to electronics and contract manufacturers, then they offshore to LCC, low cost countries in China, in Sao Paulo, they discover that the cost of manufacturing is so attractive, low cost, that maybe this time they should have the customization back in those countries because it's attractive, cost attractiveness. So they move the customization back to China. They move them back to the low cost countries, which is a way to continue improve uh, the process of cost advantages. But today they did another step, which what they found is that Customization still is better to be close to the market because the market changes. As oftentimes German printer demand and the French demand, they're all fluctuating, hard to predict. It's still desirable to do it close to the market. But close to the market, if the distribution center is in Germany, it's very expensive. If it's in Holland, it's very expensive. What they did now is to customize them, I call it near market in Hungary, Budapest, which is Eastern Europe, lower cost than Germany, but still close to the market or in Guadalajara in Mexico, so it's not US, but it's close to the US and lower cost. So you can see this evolution that I show you here are workflow innovation. Workflow innovation means that I change where I do things depending on what is the right, right place, right time to do the best things. Reconfiguration, this time is massaging where I do things. Why do I need to massage them from time to time? I think one of the factors, there are many factors. One of the factors I use this chart to show increasingly there are lots and lots of trade agreements. This chart shows from WTO, the number of trade agreements signed between countries, between regions over time. And you can see this is exponentially growing. If you look at the line, the black line shows how many of them are still surviving. The red line shows cumulative trade agreements that have been signed over time. Of course, some of them have expired, some of them has been canceled. So the red, the, the, the red is cumulative and the black line shows the surviving one. Still big one, you can notice. <laughs> Even look at the black line, the surviving ones are still huge. The huge number of trade agreements means that you must not set up a value chain and never revisit it again. Because cost change, economic change and trade agreement change. Look at Renault, Renault built the Logan car originally in Romania for Eastern Europe mostly and North Africa, but they discovered that the demand in West Europe also has been surging. Spain, Germany, France, they all like the products. So they have to expand their facility. Where do they choose to expand? 
Interestingly, they chose to build a new factory in Morocco. Why Morocco, you may ask? Why Morocco? Of course, there are many factors. But one of the factors, it turns out, is because Morocco has a trade agreement with Romania, so that the engines built in Romania can be custom-free to Morocco. And then Romania joined EU. So part of uh, that is that the Romanian built engines qualified as EU parts. And so as long as you ship enough of the engines into Morocco, the cars built in Morocco is viewed as a EU car and it's tax-free going to Europe. So all these are significant trade considerations that you can have to build in. Reconfiguring your network is a tremendous advantage. So you don't do it for the sake of saving, uh, uh, not, not cheating, but basically you, you really need to be aware of these kind of trade agreements so that you don't get burned or you also hopefully can take advantage of. The final, final innovation I mentioned earlier is this complex business relationships. Business relationship this time is more than just you and a single potentially partner, but it could be multiple partners. It's all the relationship. What kind of relationship are we talking about? Here is a simple, beautiful example of an old example, but I use the old example to highlight its importance. In the video, used to be video, of course today nobody would rent video who had a Blockbuster, but used to. This is what happened to Blockbuster many years ago when Blockbuster was still a powerful company. They would buy, Blockbuster being a retailer, they would buy the videos from the producers, MGM and Fox and so on. And the manufacturing cost of a video is very low, but they usually would sell at a very high cost. As a result, the retailer, given that it's expensive to buy one, they don't want to stock a lot. When they don't want to stock a lot, oftentimes they stock out. So the customer is coming in for the weekend, and this is really the video that I want to rent, and you could not find that movie. You have to rent something second best. So what the blockbuster and the producer have struck a landmark contractual innovation is to sell for the producer, to sell the video almost at cost to the retailer. So the manufacturers are not making any money, much money from selling. And the retailer would sell much more, but in return, the retailer would share 50% of the revenue with the producer. This was a fantastic deal. This is a complete change in the contractual relationship between the two companies and everyone benefit. So this is a simple example of contractual relationship. Of course, this is no longer valid today, given that video rental is no longer the, the way that people watch movies. Re-engineering the financial flow. These are financial flows released, resulted in contractual relationship between companies. Special payment terms, special discounts. How can we do inventory consignment and using return contracts or using wholesale price discounts? revenue sharing contracts like Blockbuster has, using price protection, meaning that if the price drops in the future, I'll give you the discount back and rebase. All these are instruments, business relationship instruments. Remember Prius, when Prius was first introduced in the US from Toyota, what Prius discovered is that the old way or the traditional way of selling cars is that Toyota would ship cars into the dealers and the dealers have to shoulder the inventory risk because the dealer has a payment term and they have to pay Toyota. But if the dealer cannot sell the car, they have to do the markdown at the end of the year. They would do whatever in sales and so on. So the inventory risk was with the dealers. But normally for Camry and Corolla, the risk is small. But for a new car at the time when Prius was a brand new hybrid coming in, it was a high risk car because at that time, hybrid was not well established and it's an uncertain car. Americans, will they buy into the concept of a hybrid? So it's high risk. Plus, the dealers have to invest in special power charger, in the spare parts, and so on. So there are significant investments. So to the dealers, it's unequal risk. They would be shouldering much bigger risk. The beauty and the, I would say the innovation of Prius is to change that business relationship by saying that I will take the risk of inventory away from you. I ship the products, I hold the inventory. You don't have to hold the inventory. You just hold the demo units. If you sell one, I ship you one. If you sell two, I ship you two. So I am balancing the risk and give the incentive for the dealers to work harder to sell the car for you. This is a beautiful business relationship for the startup phase. Not now, now it's a mature market. Prius is no longer uncertain and unknown, so you don't have to do that. But for the initial phase, it's a business relationship. Saturn has done the same thing, even though Saturn doesn't exist as a car, separate car uh, division anymore. 
what used to happen is that Saturn discovered that they, Saturn SPO, Saturn Service Parts Operations, serve the dealers that they call the retailers. But the retailers usually do not have good inventory management systems and they do not know how to manage inventory well. And so what Saturn says is that I'll change the way we work with you. Let me, because I'm Saturn, I have lots of high power operations, researchers, scientists, statisticians to do the forecasting, manage inventory. I manage inventory for you. But in return, of course, once I manage your inventory, I should provide you with some protection. So if you discover that you're out of stock, I help to get the inventory from other Saturn dealers pooling, pooling inventory. If you have too much inventory, I take the inventory back at some later point in time, obsolescence protection. And I will measure my own people, not on how well they serve you, but on how well you serve the end consumers. I change the performance measures. Now that is a business relationship change. And the result in Saturn, at the time when Saturn was still a rival company, a separate company, they are oftentimes JD Power's darling. They perform much better than the expensive car of Lexus, Infiniti, Cadillac, and Lincoln. And the retailers also benefit because the retailer's inventory turn average seven is much, much better than the industry average. Everyone gains. So business relationship innovation. Nestle recognized that if they are sourcing from the developing economies, the farmers in all these poor countries, it's not just good enough for them to give them a fair price. It's not just good enough for them to help them to use the right fertilizers, but it's to help the farmers' community to grow, to help the community with safe drinking water, to create education facilities, school systems, and so on, water treatment plants. Because if the farmers' household is better off if they don't have sick children. If their families are happy, the farmers would be better farmers. The farmers, better farmers, will in turn become better suppliers to Nestle. So this is what they call shared value. It's a business relationship. In this case, the business relationship goes beyond company to company, company to supplier, but more on the whole community, the complete ecosystem. Final example is Bhutan. This is a hazelnut example. Daniel Spitzer, a former graduate of Stanford University, recognized that it's important to develop a hazelnut supply chain because hazelnut is a great crop that the world likes, the consumers like, but we don't have enough. So he wanted to grow hazelnuts in Bhutan, but it's very difficult to grow hazelnut in Bhutan. So he created the value chain which started with nursery um, in Bhutan, but also the seed culture in Yunnan. But how can you get the farmers to grow hazelnut. And he came up with a new business relationship. The business relationship is not to ask the farmers to buy the hazelnuts, but give it to them free of charge. Because the farmers are so poor that even if you ask them to buy in a low cost, they could not afford it. Give them free of charge, help them, help them to grow it, train them, irrigation and so on. And then when they are successful in growing the nuts, buy them from, from them. But he also promised 25% of the profits would be given back to the local communities. In that way, he builds up the ecosystem. He makes everyone happy, supportive of his new business. And he thinks that at full scale, the company is up and running, but full scale, this would be 15% of the employment of Bhutan will be alleviated, poverty alleviation. So he's now working, and the good thing is that he's also growing hazelnuts on simply deforested slopes, which enable them to restore the forest back, restore vegetation back. See, again, this is an ecosystem innovation. This is a business relationship innovation, a new way of dealing with farmers, which is unprecedented. Uh, and, and it could be great, great, great gains. So I'm happy to share with you these six innovations that are exploiting how we can work inside the ecosystem. And I hope that you all maybe can go back and take a look at your respective situations and sometimes it could be your existing company, and sometimes it could be your new companies that you're building and starting up. But don't just look for product innovations in terms of functionalities and performances inside the product, but think about the interrelationship in the ecosystem. Thank you very much, Carissa, and back to you. Back to you. I'd like to move on to our question and answer uh, period here. So the first question uh, that I'd like to uh, direct to Professor Lee, um, from your point of view, which would be a good example of an integrated planning, of integrated planning within an organization? 
Uh, thanks very much for the questions. And in fact, um, one thing about the value chain um, integration is that sometimes uh, we also need to make sure we have functional integration as well, in addition to company-to-company -company integration. Um, <clears throat> what I found is that you start with first functional integration, which means that within the company, integrated planning must be a collaboration between product developments, between people who are in procurements and the manufacturing, as well as distribution, and all the way to after-sales service support. So that constitutes the integrated planning. Integrated planning would result in when you introduce a new product, you already have ahead of time the logistics support and the after-sales service support all in place. And so I think that's a functional integration. And of course, I think once we talk about uh, then involving the suppliers or within the customers, uh, the integrated planning oftentimes will be to share the roadmap and or share the product uh, introduction plan so that they would be alerted, they would be aware, they would be uh, and participating in the whole plan process as well. So I work with Cisco a lot, and Cisco has been a terrific company in being able to integrate from product introduction and development all the way to manufacturing and working with their contract manufacturers and service providers all the way to rolling out to the end of life as well. So I think this is very powerful. Functional integration first, and then cross-enterprise integration. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Um, is there a methodology to find the best value chain optimization applied to a specific case? Um, thank you for the question. I think the um, I, 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 I oftentimes would ask um, companies to map their whole value chain look at the whole value chain, and then um, look at how the things flow, the information flow, how, how do information flow in, in this uh, value chain, and how do you flow your materials, and how do you do your financial flow? And think about whether those flows can be synchronized better. So I think this is an exercise, simple exercise, and drawing the flows and seeing how flows go through your value chain and see whether the financial flow and the information flow and the material flow can be reconfigured. Yeah. Oftentimes, people think that the three flows must go together. That's not necessary. In fact, some of the innovations happen is because sometimes you do information before material or sometimes you change the sequence of the flow. So I would say the methodology is to start with a flow diagram, a map, and then see whether those flows can be reconfigured better. Okay, it's great. We have a, a number of questions here. How, how does one go about ecosystem mapping and looking for opportunities within the value chain? Yeah, so this is great because ecosystem is a huge, huge uh, one for any companies, right? You, you, so you, you don't want to put the whole kitchen sink and every single entity in it. So it's not, oftentimes I would say, it's, interestingly, is that depending on what product segment that you're talking about, the ecosystem would change in a company. Think about a company of HP, a large company like HP and Cisco, that type of Google. So for particular product segments, the ecosystem would be different. So you have to highlight the important ones first, the important ones and start with that. So I think that you definitely have to use the 80-20 rule of uh, what would be the 80% of the ecosystem, the 20% the, the of the ecosystem that represents the 80% of the values uh, and also impact uh, that would uh, affect you uh, to start with. So I would say definitely we have to start with uh, zeroing in on the top ones first. Great. Uh, how do you see the uh, sort of e-commerce as an integrating element in the Asia-Pacific value chain, and how much does it matter uh, in today's ecosystem? Yeah, good, good one. Uh, especially um, um, having having visited uh, Asia uh, so many times recently, I think the escalation of e-commerce is an undeniable fact. It's a force. It's that e-commerce is going to be a significant one. Now, but because of e-commerce, I think there are several nice trends that has uh, happened, which really resulted in a tighter integration of the value chain or the need for doing so. So one is the information integration because e-commerce. Uh, you're, you're talking about cycle times that are mm, very different from before that customers can order an Apple iPhone and accessory here anywhere in the world and, and the manufacturers in China have to receive that and be able to distribute and put things together quickly. So e-commerce has 
squeezed the information cycle to an unprecedented level, which means that you have to work much harder on the linkages in information. The second one is that you still have to deliver the products. E-commerce, of course, there are some information content products, but there are a lot of products that still have physical. How can you integrate with the logistics providers, right? the manufacturers that integrate with the UPS of the world, with the DHL and, uh, and, and Federal Express, as well as US Postal Service, as well as your own carriers, and Google has come up with a new way of doing delivery. And so the physical world also needs to be integrated, both in the information world and the integrated world. And the third one is the integration of the financial world, that companies are becoming to a new way. Uh, companies, uh, startup companies, uh, which is a very, very successful company, both in China as well as in the US, are coming up with new payment schemes that would allow company to company, individual to individual payment transfer in a much more efficient and reliable manner. So I think e-commerce has resulted in the acceleration of these kind of three flows. Next question. Do you think lean has a place uh, in value chain innovation and optimization? Absolutely. I think this is uh, very, very crucial because I think we start with uh, in the, even in the number one uh, innovation that I mentioned is the within node innovation. Within node innovation is, is you start with uh, making sure that the processes that you yourself manage must be efficient, and lean is a very good concept to do so. Because lean, of course, you don't, you don't want to do lean at the expense of everything else, but I think it still it gives you the focus on how to get things done, the non-value added activities uh, will go away, the waste stage will go away, and so that's lean concept. What we do need to apply lean is now to apply lean to the complete value chain. That company-to-company -company interaction, some of the steps are necessary, some of the cross-border signatures may not be necessary. How can we also apply the lean concept so that the complete value chain in the, the, the logistic linkages and the cross-border linkages can also be as efficient as possible. So I think absolutely lean is a core to value chain innovation. And we'll take one last question. Um, how do you deal with complaints that innovations will put people out of work, uh, fears that innovations will make fewer employees necessary? I think this is a, a good question, and what I hope we would also use the perspective is that innovation oftentimes is not just innovating in one segment and then the, uh, eliminating another segment. So, so that's one way of looking at innovation that sometimes often happens is that one segment, so for instance robotic advancements and the uh, machineries and uh, automation and so on, resulted in the segment of the ordinary labor uh, being phased out. So that's one segment hurting the other segment. The other kind of innovation, and some of the examples that I use, like Bhutan's hazelnut growth uh, uh, kind of examples, are innovations where multiple sectors get benefits. And in fact, in some cases, is the transferal. That the Bhutan farmers used to grow something that are non-value added, uh, high, not high values, but now they're growing hazelnuts, which are high value. So that segment is still there, except they're doing something different. So I'm hoping that we also think of innovations where multi-segments get benefit at the same time, because one segment was not phased out. They were just changed to doing something different. And I hope that's the kind of innovation. No question that there are some innovations that are substitution. But I hope we also, uh, the, the, uh, at, at the innovation level, we are at the innovation level where the innovation benefits multiple segments of the world. And that is how uh, we can make true progress. Thank you so much, um, Professor Lee, for, for joining us today. So thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.